Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Noel Ologo. Noel. Yeah. And um, today we're going to talk about, we're going to use the experiences you have as like an emeriti to help um, have like archives for the, <laughs> the historians to come. Okay. So we're going to ask a few questions and hope it's as lively as possible. Okay. Yeah. Happy to apply. <laughs> All right, sir. So, firstly, we want to know when did you come into the university and why? Like, is there any small story? Well, I came in 1965 to teach in the architecture program, and uh, I came from the East Coast. You still will hear an accent. <laughs> I have not lost it after f over 40, 50 years now, right? Um, I came because I liked what they were doing. I had been uh, doing some part-time teaching at Harvard at the Graduate School of Design. Um, a couple of universities inquired if I was interested in teaching, and uh, one was Rhode Island School of Design, and I knew the person who was running that program. I was interested. Um, but I grew up in Providence. My wife said, we're not going back to Providence. Um, I was also interviewed here in Cincinnati. I was very impressed with what they were trying to do. And we came to Cincinnati. I promised my wife two years. And we've been here more than 50. <laughs> you know, we really like Cincinnati and we like the university. and. The architecture program was one of the best throughout my tenure at the university. It was one of the top programs in the country. And you said you've been in Cincinnati for 15 years, right? 50. 50. Oh, okay. 50. Okay. 1965, <laughs> we came, and uh, while we thought about leaving several times, uh, we just enjoyed the city. It was a great city to raise a family. We had a lot of dear friends here in the university. The program, uh, particularly in the architecture program, was very dynamic and very interesting to be part of. So just a little bit before we delve into Cincinnati okay. stuff, um, I saw that you attended Harvard University. Went to Harvard, Harvard College and Harvard, Harvard Graduate Harvard School of Design. Uh, I'm not a doctor. You <laughs> refer to me as Dr. Smith in our telephone. Uh, th when I graduated, the terminal degree actually was a bachelor's, which was similar to what used to be for the lawyers at that time. You got an LLB. Uh, my bachelor's was converted to a master's. Doctorates in architecture didn't really become prevalent until the late 60s, early 70s. So uh, my terminal degree is a master's. So I'm not a doctor. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to know a few things you are passionate about to help lead the conversation. So, just a few things. Well, I, I, as I said, I came to Cincinnati in part. I remember going home, uh, telling my wife that I was impressed with what they were trying to do in Cincinnati. There were a number of faculty who I had met. I, got along with them very well right in my interview. They had a new thought about education. And uh, I had felt, although I went to a school that has an extraordinarily good reputation, that I had not been educated. I had learned through osmosis, through my association with other very competent, talented young people. Uh, but I didn't think they taught us about architecture in particularly architectural design. You learn by, like an apprenticeship program, you learn by following what, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the teacher told you to do, or try to emulate what he might or she might have done. But they didn't really teach you. And when we came out to here, we were talking about education, and I was very impressed with that. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about education because I had gone to an undergraduate liberal arts college and then gone to graduate school for my professional education. And Cincinnati was an undergraduate professional program. And I had to spend some serious 
time thinking about how could I participate in a program which was not what I felt was appropriate for me. And I realized that not the same type of education is not appropriate for everybody. And uh, I look back now and I realize that we don't spend enough time understanding why people go on beyond high school to get additional education. And I believe we have uh, diminish the value of college education because we talk about college without, without necessarily t talking about why. What are you there for? An undergraduate education in the liberal arts college is to become quote unquote a philosopher, to think about the great things, not to train you for a job. And our undergraduate professional program in architecture was essentially job training, job, pre job preparation. preparation. And we needed to expand the education of the young people to increase, really expose them to literature, philosophy, history. Uh, I think today we don't, we don't do that. Uh, we, we just, everyone goes to college, but most people go to college because they want to be professionally trained, and we haven't really clarified that. Okay. Long answer to it. <laughs> but it's a very important question. It's why I came to, to Cincinnati. I spent time thinking about education, and I wish we would spend more time thinking about it. And throughout my tenure in the architecture program, the faculty was a team and we talked and we discussed and we argued. We really spent time working together. It doesn't happen as much anymore. My previous interview with this, um, that was Dr. Frank Tepe, he also shared the same view about like the reason why we are supposed to be in college. That is um, training and not necessarily preparing you for the for um, the job market, so you, you saying that, yeah, you saying that really? Yes, I know, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, but it's it, we, we, we it, we're not we're not developing the educational program with a clear understanding of what the intentions are, and uh, I have three children, uh, and one of my youngest actually went to industrial design. He did not want to go to college in the sense of getting a general ed liberal arts education. My oldest child went, we sent her to Bonnet because she was very interested in the liberal arts education. And uh, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. And you should understand it, but right now we just, everyone should go to college without understanding what that means. Okay, sir, um, can you take us through your hiring process? Hiring yeah, process. Yeah, hiring process. Um, well, actually, I was recommended in Cincinnati by a former employer who was actually my a professor of mine, who I had worked with after I graduated, actually when I was in graduate school and then after I gra finished graduate school at Harvard. And I actually, he taught classes and I often was teaching his classes. He was in. Uh, uh, he was an engineer in practice, and if he couldn't make the class, he would send me to go and teach. So I was teaching classes, and I was teaching my own class at Harvard, and uh, I was really enjoying it. Although I had never intended to be in the academic field, I was going to be a practicing architect. Um, he had recommended. He and I together jointly wrote it an article that was published in one of the architectural magazines. And my particular area, he's an engineer, is environmental control systems, heating, air conditioning, lighting, acoustics. And he was, came to Cincinnati and gave a lecture. And they asked him to see want to come and teach here in Cincinnati. He said he wasn't interested, but he said if they wanted a young person, uh, they should contact me, and they did. And at that time, I, as I said before, I was talking to someone about teaching at Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I was starting to seriously think about it. Um, 
I talk a lot, so I'll tell you. But the <laughs> the issue was, I was very upset with what I had experienced at the Harvard Graduate okay. School of Design. It wasn't education, and uh, I complained a lot. I complained a lot. I talk a lot. I complain a lot, <laughs> and I realized that um, I, when I was given the opportunity to teach, I either had to shut up and stop complaining or try to take up the challenge and see if I could do better. better. And uh, when I came to Cincinnati for the interview, I immediately found people who were seriously questioning what an architectural education should be. And uh, I was very impressed with that. And we carried on those conversations for most of my tenure here as a professor. So. Uh, the interview very early on was in, involving talking about architectural education. Uh, I was impressed by their commitment, uh, their uh, camaraderie. That does not mean that we didn't argue, or they didn't disagree, but they were willing to talk things out. And, and um, that's an interesting thing too. I call it East Coast brashness. A lot of these people had spent time on the East Coast versus Midwest cordiality. In Cincinnati, people don't like to argue. Uh, whereas sometimes arguments are important. It doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean when you argue that you are having a fight. You're disagreeing on an issue and you're trying to understand each other. And unfortunately, uh, Midwest cordiality, as I've called it, sometimes everyone says yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it doesn't mean they agree with you and you walk away not understanding with what their position is. I found out that with the people that I was going to teach with, there uh, was an uh, open discussion, okay. and I enjoyed that. That's great. So I can. <laughs> All right, so do you want, um, can you talk to us about a typical your typical like class setting, like what did you hope like your students took away, and were you able to impact as you weren't too happy with your um, with what you were experiencing? Were you able to like you you said earlier on you wanted to do better? Were you able to like do better, and do you feel good about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I hope I was able to. In terms of I had uh, our commitment. As I said, I had I worked for an engineer. I was teaching engineering. Um, the approach to my classes, the engineering classes, was not to make them little engineers. Oftentimes, uh, students would take heating, air conditioning, structural classes. This is the technology classes. And I would say to make them little engineers so that if it was a small project, they didn't have to hire an engineer. I wanted to make them mature designers. So my approach to teaching these classes was to uh, introduce students to the technical issues as a way to inform their design. The other thing was I was teaching uh, engineering classes, but I am an architect and I also taught the design classes. And so uh, the intention was to introduce them to design methodologies and also to get them to explore hopefully the technical things I introduced in lecture as to how they might inform their designs. Um, design to me is a problem solving endeavor and um, I will try to get students to understand that you explore the potentials of the problem that are presented by the design intention. You explore the potentials with, inherent within the problem you're trying to solve rather than impose a, a pre-digested solution. Uh, at, towards the end of my teaching, for 10, 15 years, I taught the introductory design classes because that was something I was very committed to. How do you introduce a young person into the thinking as a designer? And it's not to, oh, I like this thing, you know, Just, impose it. Yeah. I want to find out what the nature of the problem is and let the solution evolve from the problem 
from a response to the problem rather than just be a con you know forced to fit into a frequent and, and I think that's one of the problems of architecture today. You see a lot of buildings that are not a response to the problem, but, you know, in the expression of the design is personal feeling. We have a building on campus, a uh, number of buildings done by significant architects. They're called the signature architects. And the Frank Gehry building is the one that's on the medical center, which is a building that doesn't work well, but it's got this kind of form that somewhat looks like Frank Gehry. And you wonder, what does the form have any that, that he's used, this bulbous form? Have, what does that have to do with the problem of the uh, occupant? So that was uh, what my intention. So I spent always, it was as a designer and teaching the technology, but the technology is to understand it, and again, in terms of concepts and principles, rather than solutions. And that to me is, even though an undergraduate professional education is there, it still should be founded on understanding concepts and principles, not solutions, answers. All right. Um, so, uh, I want to know, I also want to know, like, what was, like, your relationship like with your colleagues, like, those in the same department or outside? Well, the relationship in the architecture, which then ended up architecture and interior design, I, I, I loved it. We got along. As I said, uh, we would often be uh, having intense discussions. Uh, when my closest and dearest friends was Dennis Mann, who I talked with for, for almost 50 years. Uh, I met Dennis vicariously when I was at Harvard as an undergraduate because two of my roommates in my last year at the college came from Cincinnati and they kept tell, talking okay, about on, their friend Dennis Mann who was studying architecture in Cincinnati. Well, Dennis and I taught for, together for almost 50 years and we became dear friends. We would argue all the time and some of the younger faculty would get upset and, and we would be arguing about architectural issues, but we weren't fighting. We were just arguing different interpretations and positions and we generally agreed. Um, but we, that was just the way we went. And that's the kind of uh, dialogue that I had with most of the colleagues. They were very uh, intense and open and we shared ideas. We didn't necessarily agree at the beginning, but we generally reached consensus. And our program was built upon a consensual model that we would uh, discuss things, we would work together. It broke down towards the end of uh, my tenure here that things, we weren't a faculty. To me, a faculty is a group of people, people who interact, yeah. not just the people who teach. And that kind of community was not as strong as I had throughout most of my tenure here, which I really uh, appreciated. Then I also got involved with the university. Mm -hmm. uh, I became involved in university governance, and I think I'm still the only person who served two times as chair of the university faculty. So I served two terms. And I got involved with broader university issues. Um, and it, it, I served time also as an administrator. I was a chair, which is a little different in our program. The chair of the architecture program was uh, more in terms of trying to organize the faculty collectively than being an administrator per se. But um, one of the critical issues really, which I think is a problem today, is I believe a subject should be taught by the academic discipline that that falls into. Uh, when I was chair of the architectural faculty, it wasn't performance-based budgeting, which is now what happens. It was 
uh, just an attempt to fact that we were needed to increase our revenue generation. And I was also working very actively on the general education program. So I was no longer chair of the university faculty, I was chair of the architecture program. And uh, uh, I had been one of the members of the team who wrote the finally the accepted general education program that we developed in the university. We had a math requirement and architecture students, according to general education, had to take a math class, a, a course, and the um, math department couldn't handle it because we would send over a hundred students and they didn't have faculty to teach it. They said, if you send us those students, we have to hire adjuncts. Well, I'm thinking if I send my, uh, my students to math, then all of the uh, income that, that they generate is lost to us. Uh, why don't I just hire uh, a math, math adjunct uh, professor and teach the math in, in architecture? Then we'll generate more income for architecture. But that ran against my principle that the discipline should be taught by, by the, that okay. di by that discipline. That subject should be taught by the discipline represented by that subject. And that's happening right now with the university. Uh, arts and sciences is suffering because a lot of other programs to generate income. Um, teaching classes, I don't think they should. It also diminishes the education for the students. Uh, being an undergraduate in a liberal arts program, I spent four years with other young people who were going to study other things, medicine, law, business, and I know how they think. Uh, when you're only with people studying your field, you think everybody thinks that way. We don't think alike. Uh, a dear friend of mine, David Mann, who happens to be on city council here. Is that David Mann? Is it easy related to Dennis Mann? Or? No, no okay. not related. <laughs> thing. Good. But uh, David Mann actually was a classmate of mine okay. at Harvard, who I didn't know. He was from Cincinnati, but I didn't know him. I knew some other people from Cincinnati. But one time I was doing some work with Dennis and we were talking, and his comment to me, this was a number of years ago, he said, David, I, I enjoy listening, observing how you think, because you think differently than I do. Because I was approaching a design issue, and I was talking about some things which he had never thought about. And that's true, and I think we should all have that kind of exposure. So when you're taking your math class or history class or whatever with everybody else from your program, you think everybody thinks the same way you do in a sense. And you really should be exposed to people having different, completely different ways of approaching and, and learn from that and, and appreciate that. So I, I think there's a value not only in terms of financial and support and a whole variety of other things, but for the students uh, that you should be going to take a math class in the math department and not only with people from your discipline. You don't get that if you take a, a you know, uh, there was a class that when I first came, it was physics for architects. And it was taught by a professor from, uh, I think it was arts and sciences. We didn't want them to take physics <laughs> for architects. If you want them to take physics, think about physics. Physics for architects is not the way to approach things. That's a long, again. But, but uh, if, also I think like, um, with regard to like, you see some subjects, I think like if they take like just raw physics, doesn't it like teach things that don't, that's not like really necessary for like the, the course at the moment or? Oh yes, yes. They, they, you're, not, you're not, again education isn't training. Okay. Training is you learn how to do the thing you need to do. Uh, in, in reality, if a person who's been educated versus a person who's been trained, okay. let me be simple. the person who's trained is probably better off doing the job immediately upon the end of the training. And they won't ask questions. 
the person who's educated will be asking questions and will be able to develop and mature over a period of time. Training, I know what to do. I, well, I also learned that working for an engineering firm. As I said, when I worked for my professor as an engineering firm, heating, air conditioning, plumbing, lighting, things, uh, I realized most of the people, in fact, all but my boss, my professor, were not college educated. They were all tra trained. They could solve the problem the way they solved the problem before. It wasn't they didn't solve the problem. They could do what they did okay, before. Okay. They could repeat it. And uh, there was a um, an example of that where uh, uh, you could see they didn't understand the concepts and principles, and therefore they could only repeat, okay, okay. and they couldn't uh, evolve and develop. So I, I believe that education is important and you learn things and you don't necessarily uh, learn only the things that are applicable to what you're doing so that's uh, again architecture uh, physics for architects is not to me i think it's physics uh, that's that's exciting and learn to apply it uh, and of course when you're working as a designer or anything the per people you're working for aren't architects either, so you have to design for them and they have to understand them. So. Okay. Okay, um, what, did you, what do you like um, feel about or like the interaction with like administration, like your... Well, I, I worked with the administration, I was uh, the gover uh, governance, as I said, when I really got involved with, a, uh, I was on the faculty senate, and then I became chair of the university University's faculty university. with very little real understanding of what it, was. it all was. And um, I had to meet with, at that time, President Stega. Joseph Stega was president of the mm -hmm. university. And I had to meet with Joseph Stega when I got elected as chair of the university faculty. In my first conversation with him, and I must admit I was not prepared, uh, he informed me that the administration had rejected the request that the chair of the university faculty would become part of the cabinet, the president's cabinet. At the time, President Steger had a cabinet where he had the heads of certain programs, the provost, there was a provost for the medical center, the separate, there was the uh, head of facilities, these, all these people had his cabinet. And he told me that they wouldn't accept the fact that the chair would sit as a member of his cabinet. I wasn't really aware that this was <laughs> one of the issues, but I realized that I thought that that was a bad mistake, because first of all, the faculty had voted it. The faculty senate had voted it, and I thought they should respect that. And uh, I, I said, like what I was saying before, I thought it would be valuable for the cabinet, the president's cabinet, the university cabinet, to have the input from faculty on issues. And I argued that point, and I also said I realized that there would be some issues that the faculty should not be part of. And if I were there, I would have to recuse myself. Uh, you know, salaries of uh, certain things on financial, but but you should see the perspective of uh, the faculty. And uh, at that point, uh, he said, "Well, I'll go back and discuss it." We had an intense discussion on this thing, and uh, a week later, he called me and he said, "We're going to try it." So I guess I argued the point, point yeah. and uh, he at that time had a, um, an assistant who was a former military man, and he was, I can't remember his name right now, he, he was very uh, unhappy about this. In the military, the troops don't make the decisions, you know, and I'm part of the troops. And uh, after two years, and he was retiring, and I was retiring, he wrote me a note and said, he was wrong, that having me there at the table 
really helped because I would present the faculty point, point of, of view. view. Doesn't mean that I won, but I would present the faculty point of view. And uh, that's another issue. Throughout the cabinet and most of the things I've been involved with, when, when you work with people, you express, you give input and you discuss. But there's so many boards now where all you all they want is your money sometimes and, and, and your, your affirmation. Yes, they don't want your input. And I think the better decisions are made when you discuss things. I sometimes refer to it as argue. I don't mean really argue. Discuss things. Present your opinion. And through that, hopefully come to a better solution. And that's compromise. Uh, you know, my colleague of mine said, the least worst, the least worst resolution, compromise. You come to a point where you say, hey, that's pretty good. Everyone can agree. Let's move on. Not, you know, not right and wrong, compromise. Time. No. <laughs> so, sir, um, were there any incidents or events like in the school that really interested you or like disappointed you? I know there are going to be a lot. <laughs> there were a lot of things that interested me and a few things that disappointed me. Yeah. Um, so what interested me most is becoming a better architectural program. I, I jokingly said uh, uh, throughout my tenure here we were one of the top architecture programs in the country listed in the top five, often number one since my retirement. Uh, we don't get listed anymore. Um, part of the thing is that uh, uh, what frustrated me is when you try to do something just because it's the thing to do or expedite. One of the things that bothered me, again one of the reasons I retired when I did, because I felt I was still enjoying what I was doing, was the conversion of the university to the quote semester calendar. Because we're co-op, we're a trimester system. We're not a semester system. We were told we had to call it semesters. Well, we're not semesters, and I think as an academic, I don't call something a semester if it isn't a semester. And yet, so I refuse to use the term it's semester. It's terms. We have three terms. But there was no real discussion about the three terms. The idea that you could compensate for the shorter length of the term, term. almost said semester, <laughs> by adding a few minutes to the end of a lecture is ludicrous. Our lectures went for an hour. And uh, you might argue what is an hour or an hour and a half lecture. Is that the right length of time? But still, you have a topic that you can cover in an hour, maybe two topics. But adding a few minutes doesn't mean you can introduce a new topic. So our students are short-changed. So yes, they get the same minutes of instruction, but they don't get the same instruction. That's ludicrous. And yet this university was willing to go along because well, I guess we had to. The governor said, we're going to semesters. Well, we didn't go to semesters. We went to a trimester program. The intention of the trimester uh, semester was that every university, state-run university, and, and two-year colleges would all be on the same calendar. We're not. So why did you demand that you do that in in a co-op college, which to me is an extraordinary educational system and it's unique initial well it's not unique anymore but it started here in Cincinnati it's an extraordinary way to get an education if that's the way you want to go um, was much better under the quarter system and uh, it doesn't work as well and it also changed the quality of education in my opinion because when you were in the co-op program the number of students were divided into two, uh, two terms. Okay. Now you have all the students together. Teaching a class with 50 students is quite different than teaching a class with 100 students in terms of particularly lectures or that kind of formal presentation. And there really was no real discussion about that. This is just what we're going to do. 
There are a lot of things like that really frustrating. We in architecture made a big de decision. We went to a graduate program from an undergraduate program, and we never really discussed, this is towards the end of my tenure, we never really discussed why or how. We thought we were doing it, then the program was implemented, and there was nobody there to guide us to make, to give us the direction. Now they're talking maybe about going back to an undergraduate program. Uh, so, I mean, what, it, it, what, to me the frustration is we didn't have those kinds of discussions. I came here because we did. I stayed here with the discussions on the uh, president's cabinet. It was wonderful discussions. They were open discussions. Uh, and now it seems, you know, Let's just move ahead and do what's simple. And the conversion, to, uh, the calendar conversion, I think, was, was an issue. Um, even in our own university, we have schools that are, don't follow the same calendar. That's okay. That's okay. We're not all the same. It's a university. It's a yeah. big system. And to, to assume that we're all alike, that's to me one of the fundamental principles that really bother We assume everyone's alike. And we're not, and we should uh, we should embrace that difference rather than uh, fight against it, or even put blinders on, assume that we're not different. I like the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other uh, events that let me stick with disappointed you, or it's just that's all right. well the, 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 the mistake the, that was an example, example uh, okay. I, Just, I think mm -hmm. the uh, the open dialogue that we had it, it, it was the uh, semester yeah. uh, imp imposed semester system uh, in, in architecture it was the change of a degree without really thinking okay, about yeah. what it, uh, there were uh, changes in terms of uh, uh, administrative okay. organization okay. Um, years ago, when I was chair and I was talking about teaching a math class, I spoke to my brother, who was then acting provost uh, at another university, and I was ask, asking him, what do they do? Well, a lot of universities, if you have your students, and I say your students, your majors, mm -hmm. if they go from your college to another college or another unit, you share the tuition. Oh, okay. you know. So there's an advantage for you. I don't have to teach them, so the cost of teaching is not carried by me, but I get a certain advantage because I attracted the students. So there's, it, you are running a business, so you share. The University of Cincinnati doesn't do that. Your uh, departmental income, we'll say, is based upon FTEs. Student uh, scholarship and full-time equivalent students. So you you get your uh, budget based on that. So the fact of the matter is, there's no incentive to send the student elsewhere because you lose all that money. Whereas when you have a, uh, a mutual, students go back and forth, and I think that's what a university should be about: students uh, interacting with other students. This university is not financially structured that way, and uh, we do not have the administration that tries to really understand what what do we do. The one of the things that Cincinnati was often, which I fought against, was called silos. Each college stood on its own, and we used to join together. Well, one of the problems was in in. Oh, in the former, before we went to the quarter system, you had co-op colleges on the quarter calendar and you had other colleges on the semester calendar. Uh, so all of the classes in the co-op colleges were taught in that college. So math was taught in architecture because uh, you were on a different calendar. When we went to a common calendar, then we had, we started to break down the silos. And uh, I believe a university by its name is the joining together of different yeah, units. Yeah. And uh, we should encourage that. And what we're doing is not encouraging uh, collaboration. 
we talk about interdisciplinary, but interdisciplinary systems uh, need a structure that really supports it. I don't believe we have that. So I, I, I think that's, that's a frustration. We fought against the silo mentality. I think we, we did, and I think we're going back to a silo mentality more than we should. And one of the things that really upsets me is uh, the strength of arts and sciences, that the arts and science program is the core of the university. And people don't see it that way. Arts and science is not a service unit. It's the core of a university. It's where you study philosophy and history and science. And uh, we should be strengthening the arts and science colleges. And I don't think the university is doing that as effectively. What is your major? Um, I do environmental science, so. Yeah. Environmental. environmental studies, yeah. In what college? It's in its own college, like environmental studies. It, it was introduced, I think, about four years ago. It's a new, new one, yeah. So it's just by itself. It's yeah. not in a college. Yeah. No, it's a very important issue. And especially in this, you know, in this time when environmental issues are so, so critical. critical yeah. um, always enjoyed uh, when they oh. built the EPA. I think it's under arts and science, though. It's still arts and science, science. It's still yeah. arts and science. But yeah. it's just that they, they have like its solo department, like yeah, yeah. But I always it's the EPA that's yeah, yeah, the yeah. When they would use the chemical spray on their lawn, I thought that's rather interesting. They're spraying chemicals, <laughs> and here's this place supposedly it's taking supposedly care of the environment. The environment right? And if you look architecturally at the building, how non-environmentally responsive their building design is. Uh, you know, the sun has a path that rises in the east and sets in the west. It doesn't hit from the north the same way as it hits from the south, yet the building doesn't reflect that at all. So uh, I mean, there's a building that's not environmentally responsive. Uh, it's always find that very interesting. Uh, but uh, so yeah. So um, sir. Uh, okay, let's talk about how the university responds to your needs personally. Like to my needs. Yeah. Well, and uh, whether they still do like how you want. It, it did to very be. well as a as a retired faculty member. One of the jokes I always had is when I came for my interview. Uh, the central administration interview was with Ralph Bursick. Shows you he was vice president of the university, head of finance. Um, and here I am, a young kid coming, and I'm getting my interview. And I have sit down, and Ralph Bursick tells me what's good about the university is its retirement program for the faculty. And I'm thinking. Cares. I'm 25 years old. I'm here for two years. My promise, my wife. We're here two years. Well, who cares? You well, know, I care very much today. That, <laughs> yes, indeed, they had a very good retirement program. Um, the, the university. Well, I, I've talked a lot about things I see wrong with the university. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the opportunity. Uh, to work with uh, administrators uh, who were willing to dialogue that, that, that I enjoyed. I have, as I said, I haven't been there. I've been retired now for seven years, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been out of that kind of discussion for probably 12, 15, 20 years. So I go my own way. <laughs> I, I don't have much response to that. Okay. You know, uh, all right, sir. And um, let's talk about how, since you started working, like how has like the students, how do I say it? How have students changed over time? One of the things that, as I mentioned to you, that was really a, an advantage of my graduates mm -hmm. program wasn't the educational program from the university, but was the association with good students. Uh, you, you yeah, had to be a good yeah, student to get into Harvard, to get into the graduate school of design. They often joked that the most difficult thing about going to Harvard was getting in. Um, because of our reputation, 
We had a very good reputation in architecture. We attracted very good students. Um, and that was, to me, a very important thing. It's interesting that times have changed. Uh, uh, when a woman, a young lady, wanted to come into architecture, they were directed to interior design. And so we had an interior design program that was almost totally female, and architecture was totally male. We changed that. Uh, we struggled and worked hard, and uh, there, there's still the interior design program is predominantly female, yeah. but architecture is, um, is basically 50-50. And we brought education together you know, we, at the introductory level, the interior design students and the architects study together. Mm -hmm. So when I was teaching the first year introductory to design, which was a combined program, we were predominantly female. <laughs> And that that changed uh, quite a, quite a different uh, situation, um, but I think that again that uh, the people or the uh, women were directed to go into interior Interest, design. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there's preconceptions. You don't want to, you know. Well, I was told that that architecture wasn't for me because I'm Jewish. And they said, Jews don't go into architecture. <laughs> well, there are some, but there, <laughs> today there are a number of well-known, but it, it, wasn't, it was just not what you do, you know, those kinds of things, which is ridiculous. Um, do what you're interested in and you're capable of. So uh, that's uh, students. Yeah. I, I was, the students were very good. Students are inquisitive. Unfortunately, as I used to say to the students when I taught the introductory level, what got them here is what they have to know as a designer. What gets you to the university with selective enrollment is knowing the right answer to a question, you know, your SAT uh, questions. In design, as I said, you don't impose a solution to the problem. You explore the problem. And if your thought, is, I mean, this is why we really had to get them to change their way of thinking. When you take the SAT, you got to know which is the right answer. Uh, to be a good designer, you got to say, well, under, this, under certain circumstances, maybe A isn't the best answer, but C could be if now you start thinking that way, you won't do well on the exam. But if you want to do, I think, almost anything, that's how you pr proceed. Wait a minute. Now those kinds of uh, questions, so they're wrong. Think about it. You know, so uh, we spend time actually uh, getting, they're very smart. Our students are smart, but getting them to, to benefit from their intelligence to explore other possibilities rather than merely give me uh, the, the expected answer. answer, which is what people appreciate, you know, oh, give me the right answer, oh, you're, you're smart. No, the, the, guy who, the guy who's arguing under certain circumstances the wrong answer could, could be, be right. right and maybe it would be better if we could do that. Yeah, hey, that that's the kind of person that you know, appreciate. So, but I think if you nurture your students, and they, one of the great things about architectural education, we have studios, and the studios, until they got, they were actually more too many students now. In the studio, you had about 15 students, and you are one-on-one -on -one with them, and you're doing a design project, so you have a real close interaction with your students, and the students with you. And, First day, here I am, an older guy, teaching kids coming in from high school, and I ask them, what are you going to call me? You know, Professor Smith, Mr. Smith, someone said <laughs> Dr. Smith, I said, no, you call me David. Because I have more experience, but I don't have the answers. We're not here to find the answers. We're here to explore the possibilities. And that's a very important thing. You come to the university to explore possibilities. You don't come to get answers. That's training. That's brainwashing. So uh, really work with students. And our first year students, 
in a close, intimate relationship, and we had projects that were intended to do that. We got to be uh, learners together, co-learners with our students. That, to me, is very important. Um, and I, I didn't understand that when I started to teach. I remember uh, President uh, Warren Bennis of the university was a friend. And one day I was talking to him. Actually, I was building a deck on my house in Clifton. And he stopped by on his way home, and we were chatting. And I told Warren that I was getting, uh, I was still a young kid, I was, I was getting uh, uh, tense by trying to be correct. And he's the one who said, David, as a professor, you don't have to be correct. You're exploring ideas, and that's how you should approach. And that, to me, was a very important thing that I wasn't uh, uh, put as a professor to be correct, right. to give the right answers, to give truth. I was there just because we were exploring, and I don't think that's done enough in 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 our design. That's what we were trying to do. Um, I'm not certain I was able to convey that feeling in my lecture classes as much as I would have liked to in the design studio. Let's explore possibilities. I think I was able, I hope I was able to do that. Uh. All right, and also still on the question of um, what are the things that changed, that changed, I want to ask like, what are the things that changed like in terms of like diversity within the faculties and like the students, how did that change over well, time? There are more women, which is good, more women in the faculty as well as the students. Um, I come from a somewhat unique background. My mother was a, a doctor. Uh, most of my mother and pa my parents' right. friends were, many of them were professional women. Uh, I didn't realize, and, and I've got aunts and, who were lawyers and judges, I didn't realize uh, uh, what what was going on in, in a, you know the, the glass ceiling? It was just to me. I just it, it wasn't part of my the position of a woman. I didn't know what the heck that meant. Um, but I realized in looking back, yes, there was a male-dominated society, uh, and we've we've changed that. Uh, I think, and that's to, for the good. Um, we minorities. Uh, we have very few blacks, we've brought in some, um, it, it, and I think it's important. Uh, I mean, one of uh, uh, my colleagues would park in Burnett Woods, uh, African American, and he would get stopped by the police often walking up to the campus, what are you doing here? I've come to, I teach, you know, in, in and to, be, and to be able to understand that and have people open, have open discussions about those kinds of things um, is, I think, important. And the students, I think, need that exposure. Uh, and I think, but I don't think we've, we've done enough. I think our kids today have a much better understanding of things, I hope. I know my kids have grown up in a much more integrated society and have friends of, uh, they have women friends, girlfriends who want girlfriends <laughs> in, the, in the notion that I say. They have uh, uh, different interracial experiences and they're just friends. And I think if we can build upon that, things will be a lot better off. I grew up when that wasn't particularly the situation. And that's, and that's one of the things that bothers me so much about our society today is that many of us have thoughts that are inappropriate, but we know they're inappropriate and, and we, because we have different exposures, but the times have changed and we shouldn't have those thoughts. But today, this, in, in our society, they're okay to say. No, they're not okay to say. And there are things to, um, you know, that we, we need to understand. So I think the university's moving in the right direction. We're not moving fast enough. Okay. But, uh, you know, but it, it's, it's a very serious issue. Sometimes I joke about it, uh, about women. And, and I, I, some of my uh, uh, 
female friends get very unhappy with me. I said, no, 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 I, you know, I, I, I was trying to make a joke. And, and I'm told, you don't joke about those things. And they're right, you don't joke about those things because they're serious and uh, people have suffered from them. Um, okay. Timekeeper. <laughs> so, um, so moving forward, okay, I want to ask the question about, you can add all these questions together, like um, how do you see the interaction between like uh, Cincinnati and its neighborhood um, in the sense that since it was once like a municipal university moving into Good question. That. Cincinnati was a municipal. Cincinnati itself was one of the reasons why I liked Cincinnati and I've stayed here. And it's true about the University of Cincinnati, too. Cincinnati is its own city. It wasn't trying to be an eastern city. It wasn't trying to be a western. It was its own city. It does what it does and does it well. Um, we were a city school, but one of the, you know, it was really impressed upon me. John Meunier came in, was one of our direct school directors during my tenure of architecture and interior design. And he came from England, and when he came, he said something which I thought was very interesting, which was something that I had done too. What is Cincinnati? Let's not be, you know, the Harvard of, 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 of Ohio. No, or whatever. Let's be what we are. And uh, again, it's the same approach that I had to design. Figure out what the nature of the problem is and resolve it. Um, so Cincinnati was a municipal school. We were committed to the community, uh, the urban fabric to, to serve this community. When we became a state, we were worrying about competing with Ohio State. Who cares? You know, I don't give a damn. Ohio State's Ohio State. We're Cincinnati. Let's do what we do. And it's the same thing. We were an undergraduate co-op professional architecture program. Let's do what we do and do it as well as we can. Let's not try to compete with anybody else in that sense. Let's try to do, compete with ourselves, be the best we can be. And when you do that, you become very good. You know, when you're trying to compete about something with somebody else or try to be somebody else, I used to tell my students, you know, I might think I'm going to get up to hit the ball at baseball and hit the home run, but if I can't, I won't. You know, just do what you do as well as you can, and if you've got it, you'll succeed. And we, for oftentimes, we did succeed. Cincinnati had some extraordinary programs. We weren't competing. We weren't with anybody else. We were just doing ourselves. I used to get very frustrated with would hire somebody, and they'd say, well, you know, you could even say, well, at the University of Mississippi, wait a minute, <laughs> you're not ranked, who would you, if it's a good idea, but don't tell, you know, talk about a good idea, not that no. they used to do it, uh, and we should do it because they do it, uh, let's do what we do. Uh, we have extra, you know, this, this city has become extraordinary, they, it, it's getting better, but uh, Cincinnati, this little town, has one of the greatest orchestras in the country. And it has all the time. It has great theater. It now has great restaurants. We used to have three, five-star restaurants. No other city in the world had so many good restaurants that Cincinnati did. Now we have a real new scene, the Over the Rhine, and uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, so no, the things have changed. I think it always does frustrate me that when you do what you do to compete with somebody else rather than do what you do because that's what you do, do as well as you can. So I, 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 I don't like, the, you know, the competition with Ohio State is not to me a value. It, 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 have good competition, but be as good as you can be. Don't try to be, play someone else's game. Uh, I think that's a good a lesson for life. Be who you are, as do what you can, and if somebody else does something else, that's fine, that's okay for them. And don't be, don't be threatened. You shouldn't be threatened by someone else. I mean, to me, it's a kind of a principle because of 
a variety of things, but somebody else's opinion doesn't threaten me. Opinion, that because I know what I know, because I know it or I want to know it or something. You don't threaten me. Uh, oftentimes when someone has a different opinion, you, you th you're threatened because you're not sure of your own position. You know, if someone else believes different than I do, and I feel threatened, and, and you know, there are some things, if someone hates me, I feel threatened. <laughs> but I mean, if someone's position is different than mine, it doesn't threaten my belief. I mean, there are a lot of people who are threatened in terms of religious belief by someone believing else. Else, Why? That's okay for them. I, I know what I believe in. They don't threaten my belief system. But people don't see it that way. If you believe this different than me, then you threaten my belief. No, not at all. And we don't have to agree on these, these issues. So, and again, that's back to consensus. It's not that one position has to dominate. Disagree. You can do what you want. I can do what I want. Let's not fight against it. And you don't threaten me by believing something else. And again, in design, it's the same thing. You want to do this? Okay, fine. Let's find out how you do that. Don't, you know. See, the, 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 if you think about a, a problem in design, this is life too. Uh, you, if you go in this direction, is one way of going. Or you can go in this direction. The real measure is how far out do you go? How far do you take that idea? Now, you might take it out here and then say, I was wrong. I should have gone <laughs> this direction. Way. But what the, in, in an academic environment, which is an environment in which you can afford to fail, the academic environment is an environment you can afford to fail. You take a idea and you study it. But you should also, at the end position, say, was I right? Maybe I was not right. I mean, just because I got out here doesn't mean I was right. I should have maybe gone in this direction. So it's again a way of thinking. Okay, sir. Uh, <laughs> My mind. Right? So, uh, what is what do you hope to see in the future of um, UC, and also, is there anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> like <laughs> no, we're like about anything, no matter. The future of UC. Uh, I, 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 to me, it's that UC should be proud of being. Itself. itself. Here in Cincinnati, southwest Ohio, serving the population that it serves, and serving the population. I don't mean just, you know, bringing students and serving the population. We can bring students from all over the world, but we do have a responsibility, I think, to our community. That's where we live. And uh, I, I wish that we were a little bit more um, less, less looking to impress other people. Let's, let's be true to ourselves. And again, that's true. That's what I would hope a student would have, is understanding what he or she wants to do and be true to themselves. Uh, that's what I hope for the university. I'm not certain it's going in that direction uh, politically. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's, it's a, things are different different. I mean, we are a state institution. We had to become a state institution. I was involved somewhat when we made the transition. Warren Bennis was president then. Uh, it was nice being a municipal school, but I, I think even the funding maybe comes from elsewhere. Now, the interesting thing is the funding from the state what used to be much higher percentage than what we're getting now from the state, and yet we seem to be more uh, uh, dependent on the state in terms of what we do and what we don't do. I, 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 I don't think you, uh, I think you got to be true to your principles. In uh, Cincinnati, I, I've always enjoyed it. It's a great place to live. I, I, I've enjoyed Cincinnati uh, as a place to be, as a university to teach in. It's a place to live. It's been a great, great time. I would never have thought about it because uh, I grew up on the East Coast, you know. And then my wife made me promise two years, and I'm very happy we extended. <laughs> All right. 
Anything else? Uh, um, not really. And not also, really? Yeah, is there any one you recommend for an interview and why, like, just briefly? To recommend yeah, for like, an interview? Yeah, well, uh, my friend Dennis Mann, I always think of, but he's not <laughs> in town. Oh, okay. um, uh, John Hancock, who is a colleague who, who I think is, is in town and he's uh, got a very uh, good sense of things. Uh, he's still very active in what he's doing. I have walked away from my university uh, role recently. Um, a lot of people you have, uh, is, um, Bruce Getzman is a colleague of mine who's uh, in town, he's in Clifton. He's a person you might talk to. Uh, I don't know how Bruce is doing. He's, I haven't seen him for a while and okay. might be not as well. So, it's, so you're talking about faculty from the university. Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, J, well, Jay Chatterjee, who was dean of the college and who was a planning faculty. I don't know who you have on the list. Do uh, you know Jay? <laughs> uh, you're not here. She's not here. Um, uh, I have to give it some thought. Those are the, those are the names that come up. Um, it'd be interesting also to uh, talk to people who uh, may be not faculty exact, but some of the Cincinnati people. Uh, like if you could, David Mann, who's been uh, city council, he's been a congressman. Uh, friend Jim Tabell, who was an interesting character from Cincinnati, uh, who has been a councilman, bar owner, at Ludlow Garage, and he's a very interesting person. Those are friends of mine who are Cincinnati uh, based. Um, there's another one that just comes to mind, and I don't know where she is, but Eula Bingham. Eula Bingham was from a uh, provost from the medical center okay. uh, yeah. and uh, I don't know where she was a f brilliant woman, a uh, brilliant faculty person. Uh, uh, if she's, it'd be very interesting to get her input. Um, All right, so. Thank you so okay. much, sir. My pleasure. I <laughs> enjoy so reminiscing. Much. Thank you. And you can make sense if you can <laughs> out of what I've said. <laughs> and um, this is the...